for these goals are in the hundreds of thousands. Then we process this information on one outcome Y and a large number of possible explanatory variables X, trying to find which of these genetic laws I have information about the possible value of the outcome. To keep in mind from the statistical point of view is the fact that there is a fair amount of dependence between the different features, um, even though only at the local level. So features that are sitting together in the genome tend to be dependent and people that uh, features that are far apart tend to be independent. And it's also too important to keep in mind that maybe what are really the causal mechanistic variants that affect the trait might not be actually genotyped or measured. Um, and we need to be able to detect their effect through nearby variants. The standard way in which these data set are analyzed it's fairly simple, even though the particular variants I'll give you, it's a little bit cartoonish. Um, what's typically done is that we march through the genome, one variant at a time, and um, we declare a variant null if it's independent from the phenotype. So really, for each of these SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms that um, are genotyped in the genome, we fit a linear model that it's univariate, and we test the hypothesis that the coefficient of this SNP is equal to zero. Um, we also, because we are doing this a large number of times, we need to put in place some uh, method for controlling multiplicity, and we use the family-wise error rate, so we try to control the family-wise error rate at the level 0.05. Um, I told you this is a cartoonish version because we have often a population structure, individuals that are more related to each other than others. We use mixed models rather than this simple model. Um, but it still remains true that this is not a model that describes our understanding of the trait. Because the traits we are interested to study in genome-wide association studies are what we call complex traits. That is those that we think are influenced by a large number of variants across the genome. So because we have um, used these fairly simple models, there are some limitations. A major one is that not all the signal is captured. So um, in early studies to which this picture refers to, what you see is what portion of all of these traits we could explain in a data set uh, represented by the total length of the bars. And the red portion of the bars is the part that we could explain with genetic variants. Now, this is an old plot that dates back to 2009. Since then, we have dramatically increased the sample size of these studies, and this has contributed to increase uh, the power and the proportion of variants explained, though it's still fairly contained. Um, and to the point that when we want to actually use genetic data to predict the risk of individuals or to predict the phenotypes they might have, we abandon the approach approach that I have just described, and we use models that include many more SNPs than the one we have selected. Another limitation is that this univariate model lead to results that are difficult to explain. What you have in the top here, it's a, a picture of a small area on uh, chromosome 12, I believe, relative to height. Um, and on the x-axis, you have positions of the SNPs. Each dot corresponds to one of these polymorphisms. And on the y-axis, you have minus log 10 of the p-values. Now, you can see that the p-values are very, very small. This is in a la very large study. Um, but what you can see is that there are very many um, SNPs in the same neighborhood that have very small p-values. And that's because all of these SNPs are fairly dependent to each other. And when we use these univariate models, um, there might be one that is really responsible for the phenotype, but all the other ones become guilty by associations. And it's impossible to distinguish which one is more important than others using univariate models is also impossible to count really how many independent signals I have here. And so um, what geneticists do is that after they have these results, they try to create clusters of these SNPs that in this case are called clumps, trying to identify which groups of SNPs dependent among the others, the, among each other can be identified. And these different clumps here are colored with different colors. And then locus by locus, we resort to multivariate models to carry out what is called fine mapping that tries to disambiguate the role of different variants. 
Um, so now this is a seminar, you, this year, the focus of this seminar is on AI and, you know, AI right now, it's really intended as uh, deep learning or, and it's natural to ask why if we have these rich data sets, we don't use more modern machine learning or deep learning methods. And, you know, part of it is inertia in a field, it always takes a while to introduce new, new methodology. But a big component of this is the fact that in this field, we really feel the need to control false positive discoveries. The goal is not to predict a phenotype from the genetic data. In fact, if you think about it, predicting a phenotype is in many cases fairly useless. Like you, I don't need to predict how tall you are. I can just measure you. I do not need to predict what is your cholesterol level from your genetic data. I can just measure your cholesterol level. What we want to do with these genome-wide association studies is to identify precisely which portion of the genome have something to to say about the phenotype, because that one will point us to biological pathway underlying these traits. And if we know biological pathways, we have possibilities of developing drug targets, for example. So our focus here, it's really on understanding, on the science, not so much on the prediction task. And for um, this to be possible, we need to be able to control the false positive that uh, are made and to identify location precisely. Another element that just that can be considered as a way to understand why we stick to these simple univariate models is the fact that we do need to be able to handle dependent observations. Um, and we have consideration of privacy. So sometimes actually people do not want to use the entire data, but only summary statistics. So what I want to talk to you about, it's an alternative approach that we have been um, developing um, over almost the last 10 years um, that suggests that rather than using this simple um, univariate statistics, we really want to deploy the power of machine learning, deep learning, AI, if you want to, to understand what are all the signatures that um, genetic variants, um, what is the <clears throat> genetic signature of different traits. But we do want to have discoveries that are distinct and co coherent, that comprehensively describe all the portion of the genome that are relevant for a trait, and that have false discovery rate control guarantees, even if the data comes from family or structured populations. And um, there's two fundamental ingredients of this alternative approach. One is the shift from um, marginal testing to conditional testing. And what I mean with this is that we are going to say that we discover a SNP um, only if we can reject the hypothesis that SNP J is independent from trait Y conditionally on the rest of the genome. That is, we are not interested in discovering marginal association between a SNP and a trait, but we are only interested in discovering those SNPs that have something to tell me about the trait on top of what the rest of the genome tells me. This is interesting because it automatically controls for the effect of distant loci. It avoids the duplication of signals due to correlated closed variants, which in genetics we call linkage disequilibrium, and which is what I try to illustrate with this plot with multiple color dots. And it carries out what in genetic is called fine mapping automatically. So that's the first ingredient. The second ingredient is to move from the desire to control family-wise error rate to the desire to control false discovery rate. Um, this is, I find, much more appropriate for the type of investigations related to complex traits. When we do complex traits, we are thinking, oh, we need to discover the hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands positions in the genome that are important for these traits. Now, if you are out to discover to make thousands of discoveries, it's really not too bad of a deal if you make one false one. What you really want to do is to control the proportion of false discoveries, and the false discovery rate captures this much better. So what I'm going to do today, hopefully, is to give you a basic idea of what's behind 
this alternative approach and then focus on the specific challenge of multi-resolution analysis in genome-wide association studies and um, illustrate how e-values can help us selectively, um, adaptively select the optimal resolution. So first, let's start with the very basic idea and uh, let me try to tell you uh, what is the basic underlying challenge. So we want to use machine learning method and uh, let's just pick one simple one, um, just the lasso and we say we are going, you know, we cannot just do multivariate regression in the case of genome-wide association studies. We have more um, explanatory variable than um, observation. So we might want to do um, some regularized version of it, like the lasso. And we know that the lasso tends to put lots of coefficients, the coefficients of lots of variables to zero. Um, so we could say, well, I might use the lasso to try to fit a model that explains a phenotype in terms of the uh, genetic variants. Um, and I want to say I'm going to consider as important the genetic variants whose coefficient is not set to zero. And um, while the, this audience might very well know this, let me just emphasize that unfortunately, while the lasso guarantees, if it is well-tuned, good predictive properties, it really doesn't give us any guarantees about the appropriateness of this selection. So what I have here is a very small simulation studies where I've used 500, there are 500 explanatory variables and I have generated a trait and then I have run the lasso um, with one particular value of lambda um, to it then estimate the coefficients of all of these variables. And in the plot, you have on the x-axis, the variables simply in order, and on the y-axis, the value of the absolute value of the fitted lasso coefficient, which we can take as a measure of feature importance. Then the dots you see are in two colors. The red dots corresponds to the variables that were effectively used to generate the phenotype and the blue dots to the variables that were not used. And you can see that the lasso does a good job picking out the important variables in the sense that high value of the lasso coefficients are corresponding to uh, red dots. And does it a good job to identify that lots of the other variables are not important? There is a lot of variables whose coefficients are put to zero. However, if I were to say I'm going to select as important all the variable whose absolute value of the coefficient estimated by the lasso is larger than zero, I would have a false discovery proportion of 70%. So what is challenging here is to find where is the right threshold to use. Um, so I'm going to be willing to lose some important discoveries, but I don't want to make too many false ones. Where would I put a cutout threshold? And um, one idea that um, we can um, think of playing with is to say, let's use dummy variables. So let's ex expand the set of uh, features that we are analyzing with another set of features that replicate characteristics of these original features but are known to be unrelated to the outcome. So what I could do is to monitor what the lasso does for these features that I know to be unrelated and use this as a lab, <clears throat> as a stick to decide what I should use as cutoff to declare important values. Um, in this picture here, what I have done is to create 500 dummy variables that are Gaussian variants that have the same variance covariance structure of the original features. And uh, the feature importance statistics in terms of absolute value of the lasso coefficients of these variables, it's represented with the dark blue dots. Now you can see that the lasso recognizes that these variables are not important, but these dark blue dots really don't mimic the pale blue dots uh, distribution. So I cannot really use this to, to decide what is an appropriate threshold. Another way of making dummy variables that we could think about is to use permutation. So I could take my original data set, permute the labels, so I get a set of dummy variables that has exactly the same distribution as my original features. And this is the results of what happens if I do the same exercise. Again, the lasso recognizes that these permuted features are not important, but at the same time, they have a very different distribution. Now, 
there is another type of dummy variable called knockoffs that was introduced by Barber and Candace in 2015. And um, this is what happens if I do the same exercise. Now you can see that the dark blue dots very much have the same distribution as the pale blue one. So I can use them to guide my selection of what is an appropriate threshold. So what are these knockoff dummies variables? Um, let me give you one particular recipe. Um, that, assume, that is the one that we use in genome-wide association studies. Um, the idea is that we think that our observation features and uh, phenotypes are IID sample from a distribution. We make a two, two different assumptions of this distribution. We assume that we know the distribution of the features, Xs, but we make no assumption whatsoever on how the outcome Y is connected to the feature Xs. These knockoffs are um, carefully constructed negative controls um, that are, in fact, from the statistical viewpoint, indistinguishable from X. So we are going to use the uh, notation X tilde to indicate these knockoffs. And what I mean with statistically indistinguishable is that if I take the joint distribution of the original variable and the knockoffs, and I swap any variable with its knockoff, I obtain another vector that has the same distribution. So in the examples here, I could swap for uh, variable two and three, the original variable with the knockoff, and this will have the same distribution. And then they are, of course, independent from Y. Now, this allows us to see, for example, why permutations are not a good negative control. Suppose that X1 is an important variable and X2 is a null one, but assume that they are correlated. So in the original data set, X2 can act as a proxy for X1. Now, suppose we create permutated version of my variables, then X1 and X2 permute will have the same distribution of X1 and X2. So the correlation between X1 and X2 is the same as the correlation between X1 permute and X2 permute. And the correlation of X1 permuted and Y and X2 permuted and Y is obviously zero. It is also true, however, that the correlation between X2 permute and X1 is zero because I have completely created a new data set. And that means that in my um, permuted data set, X2 permute does not capture the fact that the original X2 gets a lift from X1. Instead, the knockoffs are constructed so that the correlation between X2 knockoff and X1 is the same as the correlation between X2 and X1. So how to use knockoffs? Well, first of all, you have to construct these knockoffs. And there is um, what I mentioned here. It's a literature about how to construct knockoffs for genetic data. Um, you might be interested to know that we can also leverage deep learning to construct knockoffs. So in fact, Matteo Cesia and Yaniv Romano has, uh, have a paper called Deep Knockoff that describes that. And then once you construct the knockoff, you have to use them to make this selection. I'm not going to cover too much how to construct the knockoffs for GWAS, let me, uh, for genetic data. Let me just emphasize that it is a case where it is a really, this is a really well-posed problem because we know a lot about the distribution of genotypes. We have a lot of data and there are really reasonably good models for um, their distribution that are routinely used, um, say, to impute genotype. And uh, this is a plot from one of the latest papers by Matteo Cesia on PNAS, uh, describing how these knockoffs allow us to, if you look at the original data and the knockoff of this data, um, they recapitulate um, the dependency and the cross dependencies um, that are necessary for the con knockoff construction, but they are also able to recapitulate the level of relatedness between individuals in a sample and the different population structure. I realize that this is very fast. Be happy to ask quest answer questions afterwards. I just want to give you an overview so that there is some level of completeness um, on what we're getting at. Now, suppose you have constructed these knockoffs, then what do you do? You do exactly what I sort of described in the terms of the lasso. You put your original data and the knockoff into a method that you're going to use to determine feature important statistics. 
And so we can really keep in mind as a feature important statistics, the absolute value of the estimated lasso coefficient. And then you are going to combine the signal coming from your original variable and your knockoffs in one in information, in one knockoff score for each of the variables. And these knockoff scores has to be such that the way you combine the data is that if you flip the role of the original variable and then the knockoff, you change the sign. What we can think of is that you simply take the difference between the absolute value that the variable, the original variable has in the lasso coefficient minus the estimated absolute value of the coefficient for the knockoff value. So these are, are what we call knockoff scores. And um, their characteristics is that a large W says that the variable in question appears to be important. A negative value says that the knockoff for that variable seems to be more important than the original variable. So this probably is not a variable that is really important. Now, crucially, the WJs for the null variables are symmetrically distributed and conditionally on their absolute value, the signs of knockoff scores corresponding to null hypothesis are IID coin flip. So the idea of uh, the knockoff filter is that we are going to use these Ws to guide our selection. And what we are going to do, we are going to come up with an estimate of the false discovery proportion associated to any selection and select the, the maximal number of variables compatible with keeping this estimate of the false discovery proportion below a certain value Q. Now, what is the estimate of the false discovery proportion? Um, say that we are, I'm going to look at a threshold T and say, I consider rejecting all the null hypothesis relative to the variables that have a knockoff score larger than T. So this is my value t, and uh, I'm pr plotting um, on the x-axis the absolute value of the knockoff score, and then telling you if it is a plus or a minus. So you would select only variables whose knockoff score is larger than t. Um, and so these ones would be the all the variables with the plus sign here. You are going to estimate as number of false discoveries in this set you're going to use the count of how many variables have an absolute value w larger than t, but have negative numbers. So you will estimate the total number of false rejection in this case as one, and your total number of rejections would be five. So you can take the ratio between these two values and get a valid estimate of FDP, and that is what is going to drive your selections. So let me tell you what happens uh, when you apply these two genome-wide association studies. As I hinted, it is quite feasible to construct knockoffs. Um, but let's get back to what is the null hypothesis that we test. We said we are interested in testing this conditional null that says, I want to discover variable X size that are independent from my phenotype given the rest of the genome. And I said, this is great because um, it avoids making repetitive discoveries that I do not know how to interpret. However, there is a little catch. Suppose that the dependency between Xi and its neighbors is quite high. Then it becomes a tall order to be able to identify that Xi has something more to tell me about why than what the neighbors do. And let's look at what happens this in terms of how that is true in the case of knockoffs. So we're going to just use this cartoon representation for two variables and use the angle between these two vectors to represent the correlation between these two variables. So let's say that I have variable xj and xk, and I need to construct a knockoff for xj. The requirement is that the correlation between the knockoff of xj and xk is the same as the correlation between xj and xk. So one easy way of satisfying this requirement is to say, well, I take as knockoff of xj the same thing as xj. So in this case, xj tilde is exactly equal to xj. 
Now that you know how we're going to use these knockoffs and you know that we're going to compare the coefficient that xj tilde is going to have in the lasso with the coefficient of xj, you realize quickly that this one will give you zero power because xj is identical to its knockoff. So to maximize your power, what you want to do is to place this uh, vector representing xj tilde as far away as possible from xj while keeping the angle with xk the same. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm taking the vector on the opposite direction. The angle between xj tilde and xk is the same as the angle between xk and xj, but I have lower correlation between xj and xj tilde. Now, unfortunately, when I have variables that are very tightly correlated, it becomes this trick, it's not sufficient. So I do the same here, but it's still true that xj tilde, it's highly correlated with xj. What this is telling us is that it's hard to distinguish highly correlated predictors. Now, you know, of course, that this is not a problem specific of knockoff. It's a problem that it's common to any multivariate model. And um, a common solution that it's adopted for this one is to say, well, we are going to group variables and say variables that are tightly correlated, we're going to consider them as part of the same set. We might choose a representative or you know something of along this line. And we can do the same with knockoff. So instead of constructing knockoff for individual level hypotheses, we can construct knockoffs for group hypotheses that are very much like the original knockoffs, but we relax the changeability criteria. And to stick to um, the cartoon representation, what this relaxation allows us to do is to say, I'm going to, if I have two variables, x1 and x2, um, that are tightly correlated, I'm going to call them as part of one group, and I'm going to have only to preserve the correlation of variables in this group with variable outside that group. But I can move the vector, uh, I can construct a no cost for x1 and x2 jointly together. So I can do this move, um, place my two knockoffs farther away from my original ones. So this means, this is how about, how would you construct these group features? Um, and then, of course, if you, you, you need to come up with some uh, feature important sampling for the group, and what you can do, for example, is simply sum the values of the absolute value of the estimate of the beta coefficient in the lasso. So what we do in genome-wide association studies is that we take all of the SNPs in the genome, we um, evaluate their dependency, calculate the correlation between them, create a, a hierarchical tree um, that puts together SNPs that are highly correlated earlier. We um, also typically impose the constraints of um, agency, meaning that we ask SNP in the same cluster to be sitting together on the genome. And then we can cut this um, tree at various levels to come up with different resolutions groups for uh, the genome. And then we can analyze this using the lasso. Um, what you have here on these two different rows are the results of constructing knockoffs with two different recipes um, that are simply leveraging models that have been developed in genetics, shape it and fast phase. Um, and what you have is histograms of the um, pairwise similarity of the absolute value of the correlation coefficient between each SNP and its knockoff, varying um, depending on the size of the groups. So when we construct um, knockoffs for testing the single SNP hypothesis, you can see that there is a fair amount of them that have very high correlation with their original SNPs. So this one will correspond to very low power. As we construct groups that have lower resolution, we can solve that problem. And for example, in these larger groups, you see actually there is very low correlation between a SNP and its knockoff. So when we put this together, we do a multi-resolution analysis of the genome. And these uh, Chicago plots are the graphical displays that um, we have used to represent the results. Um, let me spend a little bit of time describing what they are. Um, on the x-axis, you have position along the genome. And this, what we're looking at, it's 
chromosome 12. Um, and in, in this area, we have a, a zoom in, in in one particular place in chromosome 12. Along the y-axis, we represent different level of resolutions. So let's look at the zoom in panel. The zoom in panel, um, if we start from the bottom, we see that what we see is that we have a series of stacked boxes on top of each other. Now, each box corresponds to one hypothesis for, for one group for which we could reject the null hypothesis. So if I have a box here, it tells me that um, I was able to reject the null hypothesis that there is something in this area of the genome that tells me something about the phenotype in question, that in this case is height, on top of what the rest of the genome tells me. So I know that there is something unique in this area that it's important for my phenotype. And what you have here below is the dendrogram that was used to construct these blocks. And you can see that uh, what I have emphasized in uh, uh, light blue is the level of resolution corresponding to these blocks that you have constructed. Now, as we move upwards on the y-axis, you have different level of resolutions. You see uh, the boxes here are sometimes smaller. And if we represent, if we depict the box here, it says, well, in this case, I was able to narrow down the signal and I was able to see not only there is something here, but there is something in this smaller area that tells me something about height on top of the rest of the genome. And you can see that in some cases, um, the resolution can become fairly um, precise. In this case, for example, we can reject the in hypothesis that this SNP here has nothing to tell me about height on top of the rest of the genome. So at each resolution, these hypotheses, these discoveries are distinct. So I know that there is something going on here and something going on here and something going on here that are distinct, which is quite different from the mess that you have with univariate analysis where you really know that there is a signal around here, but not exactly too much. Now, while I do think this is quite nice, um, when you look at these plots, what you want to do as a geneticist is to say, well, uh, let me focus on the most precise discoveries that we have made. So this is a cartoon representation. Suppose these are my discoveries. Really, what I want to say is that, well, I am not interested in the fact that you have discovered all of these big block um, at this low level of resolution. For this area, you are able to narrow it down to this block here, this block here, and so on. And in these two cases, I was able to narrow it down very much. So as a geneticist, I want to look at these most precise discoveries that I have made in once in each location. And unfortunately, um, if you simply go ahead and select these most precise discoveries, you do not have false discovery rate control guarantee. And so um, maybe this one, uh, it's um, a more explicit cartoon version of it um, uh, to bring home the point. Um, and what I'm trying to represent here, it's what we can call a multi-resolution family of hypotheses. So what I'm thinking in this particular case is that I have an underlying signal represented by these dots and um, the red dots represent some, you know, true non-null. Um, and then in, in instead of necessarily testing um, hypotheses associated to the resolution of the signal, I consider different level of resolution. So I have uh, this level one, this level three, Three, this hypothesis that corresponds to a group. So H13 would be um, non-null if any of the dots underlying H13 is non-null. And then you, I have short, smaller group uh, up and smaller group up yet. And in this plot, um, false nulls are indicated in red. And, and imagine the rejections are shaded in blue and the most specific rejections at each resolution, uh, most specific rejections for each signal are indicated with these um, thick blue contours. So now what we can see is that <clears throat> if I now 
uh, count false discovery proportion, the overall false discovery proportion is 2 over 10. And then I can look at the false discovery proportion at this resolution, at resolution 2, or at resolution 3. Um, and um, you have the numbers on the slides. What is interesting is that if I look at the false discovery proportion of the most specific um, non-redundant precise discovery, this is fairly high. So um, the, the goal of the work that uh, Paula Gablens um, really led is to uh, come up with a strategy that allows us to select these most specific uh, discoveries um, while keeping FDR control. And um, she was able to do it leveraging two um, recent innovations. One is a formulation of this problem given by uh, Spector and Johnson um, that look at this problem from the Bayesian perspective. But what they introduce also, it's a criteria to describe uh, the problem. So um, let me just go through this notation because we'll um, see it again. We think that we have this multi-resolution family of hypotheses corresponding to collection of groups defined starting from P, P individual hypotheses. Each hypothesis has a weight that identifies how valuable its rejection is. And if what we have in mind is that most specific discoveries are the most valuable one, we can imagine to take as a weight um, the inverse of the size of the group. Then we're going to use this indicator XA01 to say zero if the hypothesis is not rejected and one if the hypothesis is rejected. And what our goal can be thought of is that we want to maximize this weighted power. The, we want to maximize the weighted number of discoveries while we control the false discovery rate and while we make non-redundant ones. Now, uh, Spector and Johnson gave a solution for this problem in the context of Bayesian analysis. We are not we are interested in looking at the problem from a um, frequentist viewpoint. And to solve this, um, we were able to leverage the concept of e-value. And um, I am keeping an eye on time and realize that um, we don't have uh, a lot of time left. So um, my apology if I'm breezing through this, but um, e-values can be considered as something equivalent to p-values. They are random variables that have specific distributional property under the null. And under the null for e-value, we simply ask that their expectation is smaller than equal than one. Instead for p-value, we ask that the probability with which a p-value is smaller than alpha under the null has to be smaller than equal than alpha. Now, from this property alone, you can see that e-values are going to be easier to handle. Expectation, it's much more friendly than statement on the um, cumulative generating function. And what we're going to do is to leverage this easier calculus of e-values. In particular, um, for e-values, you can see that any multiple comparison procedures that has the property of being self-consistent it's guaranteed to control false discovery rate. Self-consistency, it's a property that was introduced in the context of FDR control by Blanchard and Rocan, and it's also relevant for p-values. But um, when you look at p-values, you need to say, well, the property has to be self-consistent, and then I need to have some specific assumption on the distribution of the p-values. Instead, for e-values, if you can assure that your selections are self-consistent, um, you automatically get FDR control. And just to make ourselves familiar with what self-consistency may means, um, we can just recall that self-consistency is the property that p-values have in a benjamini hochberg procedure. So the p-values of any rejected hypothesis are going to be smaller than alpha times k, the number of rejected hypotheses so far, over the total number of hypotheses tested. So you can um, 
flip it around, keeping in mind that if you have an E value, one over E, it's a P value and say, well, so I, if I have E values, I could construct P values, then do Benjamin Hochberg on these P values. This will give you a procedure that controls FDR for E values, and it gives you the idea of what self-consistency are. So let me just state what is this uh, solution for um, our problem. Mm -hmm. We have a multi-resolution family of hypotheses corresponding to a collection of groups. For each hypothesis, we have an E value and a weight, and um, we have a certain level of FDR control. So what we're going to do is to solve a linear program that says you're going to maximize the total number of weighted discovered. So again, these weights represent the value we associate to each discovery. And X tells if the if a va it's if an hypothesis has been rejected or not. Okay. We are going to impose that these discoveries are not redundant. The way we are going to do this is to go back to the P or individual variable that are underlying this group hypothesis. And we are going to say each individual variable can be part of a discovered hypothesis only once. So if I look at all the groups that contain variable J and count how many of them have been discovered, only one can be discovered. So I simply impose non-redundancy and then I impose self-consistency. Now, you, um, there are very many constraints here because we are putting a constraint for every single um, hypothesis in the scenery. Um, and it might not be immediately evident that this is self-consistency, but for the hypothesis for which XA is zero, there's no constraint here. This is trivially satisfied because E values are positive. And for the hypothesis where XA is, XA is one, that is the hypothesis rejected, this is precisely self-consistency. Now, the last ingredient I have to give you to arrive to our solution, it's to notice that the knockoff procedure can actually be written in terms of E value. This one is the knockoff filter um, as we have described before. And um, Ren and Barber, in a beautiful paper uh, that came out last year, described how we can define E values starting from these knockoff scores. And if we apply an, um, the equivalent of BH to these E values, we get a rejection set that is exactly the same as the knockoff filter. So what does this allow us to do? It allows us to take all of the different analyses at different resolutions that we have made of the genome. And instead of analyzing separately, them separately using a knockoff filter, all of these analyses based on knockoff can be used to define E values for these different hypotheses at multiple resolutions. And then we can pass this E value to the linear programming procedure that I have just described and obtain discoveries. Now, I, this slide might not be very um, appealing to look at, so let's just quickly look at some uh, simulation results um, where we compare the results of this procedure that we called KELP, knockoff um, e-value linear programming, with um, procedures that are just based on the original knockoffs. Now, um, the dashed purple line represents the results of uh, the situation where you apply knockoffs resolution by resolution, and then you select the most specific discoveries. And as you can see, this does not lead to FDR control. Instead, KELP is this blue line and it nicely has FDR control. The, the lines on the yellow spectrum represent the power and the false discovery rate of the knockoff procedure resolution specific. And they, of course, control FDP and they can be quite powerful. Um, however, this high power for this, um, you'll see that this high power, it's associated with low resolutions. So if you stick yourself to this low resolution hypothesis, you can never adaptively identify the signal when it's present. Um, instead, you can see that our, the power of KELP is very much similar to the power of the outer node, 
while it controls FDR. Uh, let me give you some, instead of simulation, some real data analysis. This is the analysis for a, a phenotype related to platelets in the UK by bank, which is a, a, a big publicly available data set. And what you have here is resolution by resolution, the number of discoveries made by kelp, the number of discoveries that you would see at that resolution if you were to select outer node of the resolution specific analysis, and these are the discoveries of the resolution specific analysis. You can see that the kelp and outer nodes make the similar number of discoveries in this case. What is interesting is that uh, with kelp, you can make more very high resolution discoveries than what you would have made with the original knockoffs. And that's because in the original knockoffs at high resolution, you're just comparing all of these very specific hypotheses that are very hard to reject. When you do kelp, you're simultaneously looking across many resolutions. And so because you make some rejections at the low resolution level, this gives you extra power to make rejections at the high resolution levels. This is a picture of how the results look for height. So we can actually paint the entire genome and see which regions have information to give us about height. And this picture, it's valid in the sense that every region that it's depicted gives you information that it's different from what's in the other regions. It's, you know, there's no confusion and um, the resolution is as precise as you can get. So um, concluding, um, I hope I convinced you that there are, there are ways of analyzing GWAS data that really can take advantage of the most sophisticated machine learning methods. I have not been able to give you details, but there's much more work that has been completed and on, ongoing to really operationalize this program for the analysis of genetic data. So we can work, we have work about what does it mean to replicate across population. We can do use using summary statistics, but then maybe abstracting a little bit from the context of uh, genetic association analysis. Um, what do I think is the message with respect to data science in general? Mm -hmm. I, I want to put the emphasis on science in data science. I think it, science is about expanding our knowledge and our understanding. And these genome-wide association studies are good examples of them. What we want to do is to understand what is the biology behind different diseases. Um, and the, the data science methods then that we use have to be able to expand our knowledge and understanding. We cannot um, just consider ourselves satisfied if we have a machine that does what we can do or what the less smart or the less knowledgeable among us can do. Um, we really need to push the envelope and make new discoveries with the guarantees that we uh, need as a community to be able to trust them. Let me do the same thing that Jack did at the beginning. Um, this is our data science at Stanford. Weaving data science to the fabric of the university is the slogan of the Stanford Data Science Initiative. And um, we currently have position open in statistics, statistics and data science and biomedical data science. And I encourage you to check them out. Mm -hmm. And let me thank you for your attention and for the opportunities that activities like this that uh, connect us across the world through our intellectual endeavors give us um, to really develop a sense of a global human community that is not as fractured as um, we unfortunately see to be uh, often. Thank you. Chiara, grazie mille. I really, really appreciate the way you ended your talk and that we really need to emphasize the science. I liked the comment that you had in the beginning of your talk as well about why not just go use machine learning? Let's just go use deep learning and we'll let the machines all figure it out. But the thing I think you really emphasize, which I, I really am very appreciative of, is that 
we are scientists. We want to test hypotheses and that the machines, they're not going to know that, right? That they are going to be helpful tools to help us to test those hypotheses, but a deep learning system is just not going to be able to do that for us. And I think the the, the presentation that you've given really helps to, to drive uh, that home. Uh, as you were talking, and I know that you're based at Stanford, and I know that you're very well connected with the uh, data science community there. And as you were talking about the, the genome-wide association type work that you do, I was curious if you uh, have had the opportunity to apply these methodologies to other data sets, which are large, uh, spatially co-varying. And again, I'm thinking from my own experience of human neuroimaging, where we collect a lot of imaging data that has spatial autocorrelation in it. Um, and we often make multiple, multiple, multiple tests, you know, testing multiple hypotheses, and we have a multiple comparisons problem that has been particularly vexing. And I'm curious if any of these methodologies uh, you might have gotten together with my good friend, uh, Russ Poldrack, for example, to talk about how to apply these methods. Yeah, uh, we have done exactly that. So I don't have um, results to show yet, um, but especially now that we have solved this multi-resolution problem, um, we have started working in the context of um, neuroimaging. And uh, indeed, uh, Paula and I were in Russ's office um, not long ago discussing exactly which type of hypothesis we need to make. See what um, the methodology is, of course, fairly general, but what it's needed, it's for you to be able to generate these knockoffs. And um, what I hope I gave you an, a sense of is that I feel very confident about the knockoffs that we generate for genetic data because we do have a good representation of what is the distribution of these alleles. Of course, it's not going to be exact, but you know, there's lots of reasons for us to be confident about we do know the distribution of X's. I personally have not worked very much in neuroimaging, so I didn't know how well we know the distribution of the signals that we get from neuroimaging and what are the assumptions that we can uh, reasonably make. Um, but uh, it seems that you know Gaussian random fields is a place where to start, and that's that's really very much what we are trying to do at the moment. Yes, the Gaussian random fields theory has you know from uh, pioneer Carl Friston and others for neuroimaging is is a great place to start. It kind of makes some assumptions about or measurements, and then tries to incorporate the underlying smoothness of the data. Um, into your probabilistic estimates. But um, this seems to go beyond that, which is actually really intriguing. Looking at kind of a multi-resolution kind of approach, this reminds me of some work that was done by the noted statistician uh, Keith Worsley, um, uh, mm -hmm. gosh, a number of years ago, looking at multiple resolutions of neuroimaging data to try and get more precise and testing hypotheses at each level. Um, so anyway, the there would be a really interesting application of these methods, and I, I do hope to see you uh, pursue it. One question is, do you have any um, software tools which might be available? Is there a GitHub that you could point us to or some other place where, you know, there for those people who are interested in struggling with GWAS-related problems, they may want to take a look? Yes, there are um, multiple places, uh, and, you know, I should um, have um, them handy. Um, do you want me to try to put them in the chat or do you want me to just call out um, or, and send them if, to you? If, yeah, if you want to say, call them out now. And if you send them to us, we can make sure to kind of link them in uh, to where we have your talk advertised. So people may okay, so want to go. Okay, so it's probably easier if I call them out. Yeah. So one, um, Emmanuel Candes group has been um, really developing a lot of software for knockoffs. So if you look at Emmanuel Candace's page and his software page, you'll see link to multiple of these. Um, the author of multiple of these uh, software has been Matteo Sesia. So you can also look at his page. Um, he's now at USC. And finally, we have a new um, set of software that it's already available, but it's going to be released with some fanfare, we hope, um, authored by Benjamin Chu. He's in my lab. And uh, um, this is 
in Julia. Uh, so previous development have been, you know, with R or Python interfaces, and this one also has wrapper for R and Python, but the code is all written in Julia, which gives us um, fairly good um, computational performances. So there is a lot of software actually that um, can be leveraged. So far, it has not been super easy for the average geneticist to do that, in that it requires multiple steps. And uh, some of the effort that uh, Benjamin Chu has been doing is to really make it plug and play, even for somebody um, in the genetic context. But all of this software actually allows you to apply the method to whatever is the context uh, of your interest. Sure, that's really helpful. We're at our time. So let me say thank you again. I really appreciated your talk. This was actually very intriguing. I was not really aware of knockoffs and e-values and how they might relate to one another, but that's very exciting. And given my own work in neuroimaging, I I, I could see a lot of promise for this. Obviously, stuff being done in, in genomic uh, analysis is going to be very important. Um, I do some work with autism spectrum disorder, which is very heterogeneous. The the gene the genetics for it is still kind of a mystery, although we have some candidates. But perhaps a method like this may be very important. Um, so uh, I'll be looking into pursuing that too. But in the meantime. Thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your work. This was really inspirational, and I really want to thank you. Um, I want to thank everybody who is, is joining us um, on YouTube, and uh, we will not be having a, um, a, a, a seminar next week in honor of the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday, but uh, we will see you uh, in two weeks hence. And with that, everyone, have a wonderful Friday, and uh, we will uh, see you next time. Thank you again, Kiara. Thank you.